Hi everybody, welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and today I have a co-host, and that's Caroline Rena. Caroline Rena, she's one of the subjects for a racing family documentary. So if you haven't seen a racing family documentary, please look it up because it is an amazing, um, it's amazing insight into the system and uh, families who've experienced parental alienation. So today's guest, we have have is Alan Pask. He is coming to us all the way from New Zealand. Is that right? Yeah, Did I go? yeah okay. that's right. Good. So he was, um, he ended up on my radar because I'm in several of these, um, these groups that address parental alienation and somebody posted, does any, do, does anybody have an experience of the children recovering from alienation and they've had a restored relationship with their targeted parent? And of course, Alan made an amazing, eloquent um, response to that, which got my attention because um, as Caroline and um, the way we work is we want to provide hope to people. We want to give people uh, hope, not just add to their resignation. So welcome, Alan. Thank you for joining us today. Good to here, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. So, so tell me, Alan, if you can just uh, share with us a little bit about who you are and um, what had you uh, respond to this person. Give us a little backstory on that. Okay, so my name's Alan, Alan Pesk. Um, I've got two daughters, uh, both alienate, were alienated from me oh, about four or five years ago now. Um, I've got one daughter back living with me now, um, and the other daughter is still with her, with the alien, well, with her mum. Uh, I do see the other daughter, my younger daughter, uh, once, I've seen her twice this year, put it that way. And um, it's a very long process that I've sat down and worked out how to deal with it for best for me and best for my daughters, obviously, as well. So, yeah, it's a little bit about me and what I've been doing. So when they, when, um, so when they saw that post and when you, when you first saw that post, um, what were you thinking? What had you respond to them? Oh, look, when I go into the, 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 those chat rooms or those medias to talk to people or see, and see what they're writing, you can obviously see a lot of people reaching out and I understand I've been there or we've all been there and how lost and how desperate you feel because you just don't have the answers that you're, that you're craving for. And, and I've been through this process. I'm going through this process actually. And I'd like to think that I've worked out a way to get through this process. That's positive and it's, and, and takes a lot of that pressure away from you and that stress and the hurt and puts it into a positive action. And so every now and then when I'm on there and I see someone really reaching out and they, in a positive way, um, I like to just tell them my story and say, hey, look, this is something that you can do and it worked for me. Uh, for a lot of parents, I, I see them, you know, it's not just the one that I sort of get. Um, every now and then you get like 90 likes or 90 love hearts to say yes thank you for that i can use that today and you know and i think that's really if we can focus on the positives and not just the there's so much negative and hate and all of this mm -hmm. um but it just takes you down the wrong road so i just i just put it out there it's just something that i've done and worked out along the way so, and, so what did you do personally to get yourself like through well, I, I i do a lot of work with healing and my own healing journey and that type of thing i'm curious as to what you did to guide yourself yeah. to a point of not being in that you know space <laughs> yeah oh, look a lot of a lot of it it comes down to seriously educating yourself about what it is mm -hmm. and about the people you're dealing with and um for the first i'd say six months i was lost i really i was a mess i didn't even know there was a thing called parent alienation i just thought my world was just collapsing around me yeah. and i went and saw a child psychologist to try and work out what was going on and she's the one who basically said oh this is what it is gave gave it a name and then i could go home and i could research and then i just started learning and learning and learning and learning all about it learned that the alienator and 99% of the time is a narcissist 
right, learn about narcissism. Why, why do they do it? What have I done? How can I work with that? And so once you've got all those tools and educated yourself about it, you can then start applying that to your own life. And I found that gave me a lot of peace, inner peace, because I actually understood what was going on. And I also understood it wasn't me. That I haven't done anything wrong. And I also then started to learn about what my role in all of this would, can be to be a parent still to my daughters, um, even though I don't see my daughters. Because I had to also come to a realisation that, no, I'm not going to see them very often. And it's going to be a long road. Everyone said, every single media I went down to learn and educate myself, it's a long road. Mm -hmm. And once I accepted that, so, okay, well, how can I be a positive parent during this long road and have what, and take control. And that's another thing I found taking control of your life, taking back the control, I should say of your life and implementing that into the whole thing as well into the whole scheme of things. So yeah, that's it. Well, I definitely acknowledge this, the child psychologist to, mm -hmm. for even being aware that there is a term called parental alienation for you to even empower yourself with research on because it's been our experience that even um, in the mental health field many uh, are really haven't educated themselves on on what it looks like yeah yeah um, well, oh go ahead, go ahead. Well, i was no, just no, no. quick how old your how old your daughters are uh, my eldest daughter is 18 Okay. And uh, my youngest is, oh, she turns 16 tomorrow. Okay. Wow. Wow. And the other thing, the other thing I found is a lot, in reading through the groups, a lot of children go through, or a lot of alienation happens during the teens. Mm -hmm. And that's and the, another thing that I found out is that the, the teens is when the children, the, the brain lock, uh, shuts down, the frontal lobe shuts down in the teenagers. And they don't want to be around parents anyway. So it just, everything gets emphasized and has made a lot easier yeah. for the alienator to do that. And uh, yeah, that's it's just true. something that I've found out as well. Teenagers, teenagers are out actually at that time of life are individuating. So they're trying to yeah. figure out who they are. And then when they can't figure out what's happening around them and they just kind of crash yeah. in on themselves and lock down without in a normal situation, you know, but yeah. with this, it's even more intensified when that happens oh, very much so and 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 also don't uh, and obviously with my daughter coming back to live with us um we hear the other side of the story too and it's not all roses it's made out to be roses narcissists would love you to think it's all roses it's not and and the other thing is with a narcissist relationship, they don't change. They're the same and they're so predictable and, and that's learning those predictions. And so you can preempt what's going to happen um, from, from an action you may take. That's how it be. I get it. You know, it, um, it's great that you have the wisdom uh, to, to understand what they're going through because they are going through um, a traumatic time in their lives at a time when they're, Friends should be the focus of their lives, not their parents' yeah. conflict. Yep, yeah, very much so. And and the, them shutting you out is just a really easy and natural thing to do. Um, it's just made worse because you don't have the support from the other parent to say, hey, you need to go and see your dad. It's actually encouraged to, no, 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 yeah, he's a waste of time. Don't worry about it. You know, so, yeah, it's not it's not easy. You know, I, I was on the phone today with, um, with a parent and we were addressing that very thing also, although the child was much younger. And, um, and I'm just like, you know, if your child is at an age where they don't have the right to determine their bedtime, they don't have the right to, um, to, to, to choose to go to school like in normal situations, obviously. Um, if they don't have the right to say that they also don't have the right to say, ah, I don't want to talk to my other parent. And, um, and it's not healthy for that parent to, to be okay with that. No, it's not. And a lot of times you're going up against, um, you know, you've got the other parent that's all too willing to add to the sabotage, but it's something where you, like I, what I was sharing with this one parent, you have to be have a stand. What you were, what are you committed to? Because if a child does not 
uh, have a loving relationship with both parents and you're not a stand for the, the both parents, you're dooming that child to a future of broken relationships and unhealthy relationships. And that's are. really, that's sad in this situation, especially because I've talked to quite a few, I do an interview on another uh, site that I have with a, a, another partner and we've interviewed three, four, maybe five fathers. And what I'm noticing is there's a trend in the fact that these fathers, such as yourself, it, it's like you got, you're good fathers. You're, you, I can tell just by looking at you and, and I feel your energy is there, there's a piece there. There's, there's a, um, so, so basically what I'm saying is that there's a point where, um, you know, with this fatherless generation that's happening, the, the fathers that don't want to be in their children's lives is one thing, but the ones that do want to be there and they're good fathers, that makes it exponentially worse because, you know, there's a, there's a, a such a piece. I mean, to me, I would think that the kids feel that missing link even more because they know that their dad is, at least the older ones, know that their father is decent. But, and they don't really under, they're very confused and they don't understand. So my thing is I commend the fathers that I've, to include you, that I've spoken to because you guys put off such an energy of love. It's like, my God, you know, I wish my dad was like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, oh my God. And so there's a lot of fathers that I'm seeing just like you, you know, and that's the sad part is the, it's there, their, their fathers are there. You guys are there. And there's nothing, it's still happening. And it's, it's sad in that way, you know? So I just wanted yeah, to is, get that out. One of, the, one of the things, you know, you say about putting out the energy of love and even though, and this goes for mums too, it's, it's for all of us. And that is, even though we're separated, you've just got to change how you parent and not, not your values. You've got your values, never break those, stick to those. But it's about, okay, I can't tell them it's time for bed. I can't, I've got no input on this. I've got no, but what do I have control of? I can write to my child. Now I was cut off on every form of communication possible, except for writing letters. And the child psychologist I spoke to said, write letters, even if it's a card, a few words, you'll be told it's horrible, but just keep doing it. And it has a massive impact on your children and their recovery later on. Now they might not get the letters and I don't think they got all my letters, that's for sure but they definitely got some. And what they do know is, and it helps the children in that time, A, you know what, dad does love me. Because your children do love you unconditionally. They're just trying to protect themselves in a hostile environment. And the way to protect themselves is to say, I hate dad and, and keep mum, or keep the other parent happy. Keep the uh, alienator happy. Absolutely. So, I, I get what you're possible. saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, I get what you're saying. It's, it's so uh, a lot of times they have to keep their love hidden and, um, and they have to go with what makes life easier and less confrontational. And if it means that they have to, um, even whether they pretend to dismiss you or marginalize you, or actually they do, uh, a lot of it's that's the path of least, least resistance. We have a, another advocate and she calls she calls um, that the chosen parent. They, they get that you were safe and you'll always be there unconditionally. So therefore they have to survive the other parent. Yeah, because if they confront the other parent, the other parent will take away their love because love to a narcissist is just a commodity to use as they want to get what they want. And, and if they're gonna take it away, yes. you're being alienated because you're the safe option because you're gonna come back if they need it and, that's and they what we've have got. to have that they've got to have your unconditional love that's ever present even if you don't get any indication that they're aware it's 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 a constant sending it um i know many years ago i would call every day every day that they were not with me and every day i would get voicemail until one day i i was unable to make that nightly phone call and i got my child came, he, he laid into me about not calling. And, mm -hmm. I, and I just secretly smiled and I'm like, so he did know I was calling all those other times. That's cool, that's really cool. That yeah, cool. yeah, and well, for the I, children, 
no, that's okay. Um, for the children, it's like, it's an, well, for anybody, it's an automatic stress response. That's how they protect themselves. It's the only way they can, they can do that. So physiologically, this is all going on in their minds and their bodies and everything. And, you know, they got to do what they got to do. And when they're living under the roof of, a, of an alienator, they have to adjust to make, make it safe for them. Because like, you know, Danica's saying, you're the safe parent. You're the mentally healthy parents. <laughs> they got to do something to, you know, deal with over there. And you are, and someday they'll recognize that. Um, and so they, they do, you know, my son, my son recognized and actually recently so did my daughter, you know, so now I'm kind of in that path with my daughter finally coming back. But it's, it takes a lot though, because they have to break through all that stuff. You know, that's yeah. a lot of miscommunication, confusion, anger, hurt, you know, who am I? I don't know who that guy am, all that type of thing. And I think the other thing to take into consideration is that you're separated from your ex for a reason. Yeah. Your children can't separate. They're there. They have to live in that environment that you left or whatever the reasons being. And so they, like you just said, I agree entirely. They have to find a way to compensate for that, you know, and all deal with that and live with that. And the hardest thing I think for, for me to come to terms with was the fact that I just have to keep giving out the love. It was, it was hard initially, but obviously then you go, okay, this is great because I had a control. And that is every time I, they sent me a message saying, you know, I hate you or dad, you know, you're, you're not my dad anymore mum's new boyfriend's more like a dad than you are and things like all those really hurtful things it's just come back hey sweetie i'm sorry you feel that way because it's her feelings not mine and i love you and the thing is no matter how many times they throw that nasty stuff at you i love you and just don't rise because they want the drama the mum oh sorry the alienator i should say wants the drama and take it away because that's what they want and that's the biggest thing i think i found through the whole ordeal is, and probably the hardest that start at the, at the start by far, is not engaging in that drama. You know, you get that message, it hits all those buttons and you're just like, <laughs> and it's just a case of no. And I know it was my partner that put me onto that and I've got a, a lot to thank you for. And that is, no, just put the phone down. And I'll be like, no, I need to, I need to get back at this. That's not right. No, but I did hear it and, a parent comment on uh because i was saying this to another parent a while ago in the states and she said no well she's actually had to go to court because the laws are different for for you guys in america whereas because she didn't respond the alienator's lawyer was saying well that's a yes no response is a yes so i would now so now when i advise anything like that i say well just if you need to say something just say no but forget everything else just just a simple word and take away all the drama and then it helps and i also after talking with my daughter that's back with me now not engaging in that drama was good because it's like when two parents argue kids don't want to see that but it hurts them and so the drama is hurting them so take it away and that was that's and that's one of the things that i found i can still parent I just not parent and how I was brought up to it was going to be, or when I had children, what I envisage it was going to be like, but what can I do? What can I take control of? And that's how I did it. That's really powerful advice. I, I, I like that. I wish I'd known that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd known it a lot earlier too. <laughs> and you have to be that you really um, have to be a stand for um, the healthy side because the only yeah. way to counter like the antidote, to narcissism repeating itself in your children is making sure that their your children have at least one parent that gives unconditional love yeah. and doesn't look for an opportunity to you know to sabotage sabotage the other parent mm -hmm. like i'm sure that there'll be times when your children will be like open the door and give you the opportunity to totally um, throw their mo their mom under the bus but that's something it's like resist the urge <laughs> yeah. To, yeah it's an urge <laughs> it's definitely an urge <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, totally <laughs> yeah but like even with my daughter that's come back now she she came back initially 
um, and then she, uh, her mum literally disowned her, sold everything she owned or threw it out, sold her car, spent money that she had in savings, everything, literally shut her out, took her sister away, contact from her sister, and that really hurt her, but she actually got to see the other side, and she understood, sadly, but in a positive way, she does now understand her mum. She still loves her mum. And we, I promote that. I know my partner. We both do. But it's about understanding the situation. She went back to her mum and lived, started living there again. And it all unfolded and all happened again. And she lost everything pretty much again as well. But she's back now and she, and she, she has a really holistic understanding of what has happened to her and what's going on. However... From our side of things, we always, it's your mum, you know, let's not say bad things, or um, that's how your mum is, you know, it's, it's, we don't put her down. And I think it's so important not to do that. And I've always said, be the total opposite to the alienating parent. And, and, and if I can stop my child from being a, or prevent it, them from being narcissists themselves, I'll do whatever I can in order to make sure that that happens because it's such a mm. such a hurtful illness, I think. And not only being the total opposite, you're being who you are. That's you. Yeah. And yeah. it's not it's not some made up thing like her, who everybody, there's a deep down sense of um, everyone is made of love. If you can reach through, through the outside thing, that's all anybody wants is to give and receive love. So, you know, if you behave in that manner, then the child can see the difference. Like for example, um, I, I, I chose at one point to step out of my daughter's life um, when she was like 16 and my son had already um, been adopted by a stepmother. And um, it literally, and, and in the back of my mind, I heard, you know, do this so they can see without you there that they're still behaving the same way and they can't blame it on you. You know, so it gives them that sense of understanding of what's really going on. If you're not in there trying to do what you're trying to do and you can step out, then it's not you anymore all of a sudden. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. And know? they have to point their finger somewhere else. They can't yeah. just keep pointing it at the same person. Right. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's so it's hard. literally a way to give peace. And, and also, I think it's really important for ourselves during this time. It's so easy to get caught up in the hurtfulness and the toxic the toxicness of the whole situation is to look after yourself you know and I went off and did some things that I've always thought oh, I'd love to do that <laughs> so I did it and you know and and put a lot of um a lot of my energy into my company and the energy for my children was into research because I, I wrote my letters but that was pretty much all I could do at that stage but the more I could learn the more I could help them and that was, that was my way of parenting. And a little thing about the letters that I used to write to my daughters, I also took a photo of them and I e set up an email account for both of my daughters. And I used to email the letters to that. So one day, if they never got the letters, there was a record of all these letters. And I gave them to my daughter, gave her the password to the email account to my oldest a while ago. And she was crying. She said, oh, she goes, dad, I did keep the letters. I did. I never threw them away like mum said. I, I hid them under my drawers. She didn't know. Now, that was, that was really moving for me to know that because I was told that they were thrown in the bin, not even opened. And, but that was to stop me doing it because it was a control that I had that I, they couldn't, she couldn't stop. So write the letters and keep a record. And one day, you know, that could be it is very valuable to your child because they need to know that there's something to fill in that gap that you didn't just give up on them and they've come back to, for you, you've always been there and it doesn't have to be a massive letter. Don't get into drama. Don't get into explanations. Just thinking of you. I love you. You know, miss you. Don't put too much on the miss in the sense that you're trying to put pressure on them. I'm here when you need me. And then it's about keeping your foot in the door, basically. So when they're ready to come back, they know, hey, dad or mum, they're, they're, they're welcoming. And what happened was exactly what you see, Caroline, you know, there comes a point where they can't point at you. So the, the internal struggle comes within that, that family unit. Mm -hmm. And 
that's when my elders reached out to me and said, Dad, this is what's happened. And it's not fair. I'm not understanding. Can you tell me what you think? And I was like, wow, blew me away. So we talked it through. I brought it down from a quite an angry situation. I said, sweetie, just go to bed, go to sleep, turn the lights out. I said, it will be, your mum will be gone to work in the morning and then you can go and do what you need to do. I wasn't, I wasn't contradicting the mum saying, yes, yeah, sneak out the window, which is what used to happen with me. Um, it was about a case of just calm the situation down. If you don't engage in it, no one's going to engage you. There's no more drama. It's all over. She went, okay, dear. And I remember she was crying and she goes, I'm going to sleep now. And then the other one started messaging me. It's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just the case of how that a shame how you that's how you feel you know i love you <laughs> etc etc well no matter what anybody says alan i you are your daughters are very lucky that they have a father like you in their lives because it's this is so i say it over and over again it's so powerful to see a father you know when i mean i can i can feel the love just here in the zoom call <laughs> <laughs> It's just I can feel it. So your daughters are lucky to be to, to have that because they I'm sure they can feel it too. You know, so oh, I'm, I'm grateful yeah. to have met you. This has been a great, great show. It's just a, a show filled with with unconditional love and hope. And um, and that's what I saw when I read your post, Alan. Um, and thank you so much for joining us on the show. I'm sure that everybody who's watching has gotten a lot from it. And, um, and hopefully we will speak again soon. Yeah, likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So that's all we have for Custody Matters Live. Uh, we will see you again next week. Um, and thank you for joining us.